Hello, good evening, welcome tonight on the David Ellis Report as our Prime Minister, Alexander, Al to his friends, aka Boris, announces a threshold of six people, no more for a gathering, uh, and bringing in marshals in order to facilitate that. So, are we under martial law? Or are we at war with China and we just don't know it? As Steve Baker puts out a really amazing tweet on um, a very old and appropriate poster citing uh, that socialism would end up with people intervening in a Stasi Gestapo-like fashion. This is highly apt as David Scott and I recently on a report spoke about the Churchill forecast in 1945 that a continuation of leftist policy would ultimately end up in a political police in order to enforce it. And at the same time we see parliamentary activity being severely curtailed and Peter Bone MP complaining to the Speaker that once again Parliament is being circumvented and the Prime Minister and just makes announcements of diktats without consulting Parliament. This lets us know exactly the status of affairs. It's not just Parliament not being involved or consulted. The great British taxpaying public and the whole Brexit debate is void of the future defence and security arrangements. As we head to the end of the transition period with David Frost now heading up national security and the Brexit negotiations, we can see that there are issues. But keeping the silence cannot really be allowed any further. Early today I was joined by Rusty Furman, SAS, 22 Regiment a veteran of special forces with considerable defence and security expertise. Rusty, what an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, and we're going to hopefully rattle through some of these defence issues from Northern Ireland vets, ministers, Johnny Mercer, uh, and what's going on with this defence review. But could you first just tell everyone how you ended up with no gloves when you went into the window there in the Iranian embassy? Yeah, it's quite simple actually. I was watching snooker before we went in, next door, um, 5th of May 1980, waiting to find out what was going to happen that day. All of a sudden, right in between the middle of the snooker, me and Johnny Mack and a few of the other lads were watching it, Cliff Thorburn versus Alex Higgins in the final, put my gloves on the table instead of down my body armour. Once we got the, uh, the call out to get into position because the terrorists had actually killed the press attaché next door, a guy called Lavasani. We got the call, we got into position, but actually I left my gloves on the table while I was watching snooker. Got outside the building, it was too late. The reason there's a picture there is because the police snipers took that picture as we entered the building to rescue the hostages. And that was it. It was go, get on with it, do it. That's it. Yeah. And I wasn't going back for my gloves. No. I got them at the end. Crack they on. They were still where they were. Yeah. And that That's was it. the job was done. Job was done. Yep. And that's it. Um, can, you, can you tell everyone, because uh, you're involved with quite a few veterans charities and you're a patron of a couple. Can we just let everybody know what you're doing with that work there? Well, I started off... Um, with a charity, obviously, um, which I have a little bit of involvement with these days, but I've moved on uh, slightly, and I'm working with um, a charity called Vet Run 180, north of England, um, with injured lads who actually, it's like veterans running themselves. We are there as a page and just by name. Um, they've got a self-funded setup, and as little as last week, they did a coast to coast um, where they support themselves. You know, these are injured lads um, taking themselves out in the Land Rovers and stuff, um, off road, and six days or so, something like that. And it gives them a bit of a life back because when they left the forces through different reasons, um, there's nobody there to help them. But the likes of us, put our time and effort into it and get on great with them. And only the week before that, they were down John O'Groats to Land's End supporting pilgrim bandits 
nearly a thousand miles over 13 days and I was here at the end when they came down to um, Land's End to meet them all and once again all of them veterans supporting veterans and they had a great time and I can't say enough about it yeah. that's the uh, two main charities and then there's the homeless veterans up in Scotland which I'm a patron for um, and they look after they've got a setup there where they bring veterans in keep them there for about arguably two to three months um, sort of get them back on the road and then they move on and some new ones come into the house and stuff but it's a bit difficult at the moment yeah. to do the fundraising and stuff because of um the covid the covid yeah it's it's knocked a hole in a lot of stuff all the cancellations it actually means where they were making money when we turn up and do our events and stuff they can't be done at the moment and yeah. haven't been for months so it's actually things like that which they've just been able to do they've crammed it in but now there's new rules again so as much as you plan ahead you need a second plan yeah. a third plan but once the guidelines are put in place what you can and can't do chop you know and all that planning is wasted yep. and the lads will be like because they want to do something which we've just seen which we've just seen yeah yeah, yeah. so it's impossible to how do you do it yeah you can't what you can do is we do stuff um over the the zoom and all that type of stuff you know but it's not the same as physically being there no, no. getting in with the lads um and seeing just how they are these days but at least we got some in yeah. very quickly for the last couple of weeks who knows you know I've just had another one cancelled down in Cornwall that was cancelled yesterday we were the new one in Scotland in October that one's cancelled so we're there but actually we're not quite getting what we want to do but we won't give up no it's as simple as that we don't give up no well, right. that's where always a little further yeah so that sort of brings us on to the legal pursuit of the vets and particularly the northern ireland veterans um which is where i sort of first come into this with trying to help dennis hutchins with his case yeah um uh, and you you're involved with with some of these some of these guys well <laughs> i'm in the group justice for northern ireland veterans not the Mickey Mouse one this is the proper one right um, which is run properly and we have a group there which tried to help and support people like that I know some of the lads Dennis Hutchins um, I went down to support him in Plymouth last year before the lockdown um, and he had a good following there I went down I was going to speak when they were going to do the statute of limitations down at Parliament Square all the lads turned up all the veterans got there and then with a few minutes to spare before they were going to read it and i was going to go in with dennis and one other to listen to it and they came out and said it's cancelled we haven't got time we will just reschedule it absolutely shocking all those people turning up smart ties peaceful parliament square we're all waiting just to be told Scratched. it's got to be scratched it's not on so it's not on and um, that's what we're fighting against yeah you know it, everything that we should be doing in my opinion yeah they put this face on here then they grab the second face and bring it around yeah. and they expect you know people walk away and think do you really think we believe that yeah because we they're, don't. Not, they're not convinced you know there's certainly our side of it they're not convincing but this this next thing i've got on my list of notes here is you know the does yeah. do the mps and the ministers care and what does the government care well that's a question you can't even ask them um, because they won't answer a lot of questions and they tell you what they want you to hear yeah. in one hand it sounds like yep and you read it and it gets mentioned but it doesn't go any further I'm no further in my head forward with Dennis Hutchins or anybody else Soldier Ref and the rest of them yeah absolutely no further forward apart from what you read what they say but where's the action we've not res it's not resolved there's, no, there's but nothing the, but the problem is rusty is it's looking like it's escalating it'll escalate because we've got a lot of veterans 
and a lot of them are on side. All they want to know is what we're going to do about it. If somebody gives them the answer and starts showing them what's going to happen and then do it so they can see with their own eyes, it probably won't escalate. What will happen is they'll say, ah, oh, great. They'll get together and they will support that. But at the moment, I don't see, I really don't see, again, where the action is. Yeah. You know, I went down to Plymouth for Dennis. I thought Johnny Mercer might be down there. Um, never saw him. And that is, you know, Plymouth. Well, that's, that, that's, 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 that's perfect, because it's the next thing on my list is Johnny Mercer. Showed a lot of promise as a backbencher and on select committee, yeah. had a bit of a go. And now we now we see him as veterans minister, and it's I, d I don't know how you would how you would say it, you know is he been taken cap is he been taken captive by the cabinet office <laughs> because now we've got you know it's all seems to be, it's all going wrong. But the thing is, if he doesn't speak out, you know it's it's the same old thing. You get a little clip of saying what argument might be the right thing, but when he first come on the scene, it looked like. This was going to be the yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't forget. Yeah. Yeah. And I was proud because he's X29 commando, yep. which I am. Yep. So I was like, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, I'm just taking a look now. It's turned. And yeah, the civil it's servants. Yeah. Um, Are they? Do you think they're writing his script? Well, the, the civil servants are clever, right? Mm, yeah. Let's be honest. Look at the other side, they may not be quite so clever. So maybe there is some script writing going on. Yeah. But what happens is, and what I think, and nobody will tell me what to think, I'll tell you what I think. Yep. I just think that he can't do, even if he wants to do what he wants to do, because it won't please them. But you have to be very powerful to go ahead and do it. That's my, my question is, is it powerful enough to say, I'm the guy in charge of this. Exactly. Now, if he is, yep. you know what? Stand up, tell them, and get on with it. Yeah, correct. That's your job. Totally agree with that. That's it. Job done. Job yep. done. So that brings us on to um, this current um, period that we're in with <clears throat> going towards the end of the, the end of the sort of Brexit period and apparently coming out in December and the defence review and David Frost who's now head of national security, and we're in the middle of this period where we're conducting a defence review. And we're seeing all this stuff coming out in the press. Dominic Cummins going to visit the base, uh, the SAS base, and he's also been on a bit of a grand tour. And then we see other bits in the press talking about, we're gonna take all, we're gonna get rid of all the tanks. <coughs> well, I can understand going to look at the SAS, um, they're the finest in the world, in my opinion. I can understand him going to the SPS base and having a look at what the SPS get up to. Um, I would think that would be part of it. And what you see is it takes part in an exercise, kidnap exercise and stuff. You know, I've done that for years. I've done it with all the royalties myself. Um, so I understand why, but with the uncertainty and the size of our armed forces and what's possibly around the corner is I'm just worried and wondering why all at once, including if I'm not mistaken, MI5 and MI6, um, what's going to happen? Why? You know, you go and look at it and stuff, but there's no follow up to say anything apart from he's been there and done it. And it was broadcast in the newspapers in particular. And um, it was one or two um, why it was happening. But once again, <laughs> there is no, not from them, why and what they're thinking. Yeah, the proper report. So, yeah. something like that. Yeah. But the British public, including myself, would like to know why and you know, something there to give a glimmer of hope, if you like, because all that happens is these clever people, everybody starts talking, everybody's got a different point of view. Then things can escalate because it's simple, because nobody's telling anybody anything. Yeah. They're doing it 
and they broadcast it. But that's the end of it. Well, we've got a, we've got a bit of an over, we've got a couple of factors that keep repeating themselves. One is this silence, isn't it? We've got this, you know. Okay, so Cummings has been to Hereford and he's been on a bit of a tour. Yeah. Then we see this, you know, a bit of a, a bit of traffic in the press about we're going to, you know, there's going to scrap the tanks, which is just insanity. Uh, but there's no actual what we're doing. No. What we intend to do. No. Do are we going to increase the defence budget? Are we going to increase fighting capability? We're not. That we're not getting that. Well, you're not. I mean, what are you going to do with the tanks? You, you put them in mothballs. Okay. Why? Because when we ever need them, nobody's going to be capable of dealing with them because they're not going to be trained on them. Well, it's a nonsense, isn't it? So it's a nonsense. It, it's a nonsense, and pr probably if they did, they'd probably sell them on to somebody else, because I don't see the point in, in mothballing them, and armour especially our armour, you know, the challenges and stuff, um, arguably the best in the world. Thank you. And we're getting rid of it. No, nonsense. It, it, we're getting rid of it. Yeah. You know, that's but what for. Just... Even the senior, some of the senior ex, you know, right up at the top are saying why. But the silence is, okay, silence is golden. But actually, in this case, the public need to know. The taxpaying public. Everybody, yeah. yeah, everybody. We bought all this stuff. Yeah, and they need to know, and a lot of them want to know, and I was shocked when I did my video um, last week, how many people didn't even know what the EDU was about, yeah. or why. Yeah. And at this moment in time, they're still going, okay, so are we, are we gonna, when we leave, are we going to leave the military behind with them, EDU? Yep. Or do we have that break and we say goodbye? Yep. But it sounds either way because why are we getting rid of the our hardware? Oh, it's a, well, it's a, well. If you said, well, you know, well, it's, there's no rocket science. If you there. take the armor off the army, what is it? It's an army without armor. What? <laughs> and it's, it's an now army, a third world army. An army in name only. It's, yeah. But this doesn't make any sense. If no. China and Russia are so bad. Yeah. Why are we disarming? And that's the caveat, if. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but once again, there's nobody telling anybody. What they're doing is, they're doing it or proposing. I, I, I'm thinking, are they looking for a reaction of somebody? You know, is it going to... And they, there is, there is a big reaction of the people that I'm dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the more that we can get this out, the more people, yeah. our public... They get to know they about it. They need to take it. an interest in and this. Yeah. We've got a lot of veterans in this country. Yeah. Four million, maybe. Yeah. Times that by their family, 12, 15 million. It's not a bad shout. And then. Well, there's, a, be there's happy. a balance of power there. Of course there is. And this is a critical bit of still being a country. We yeah. want to leave Dominic Cummins, take him back control. Yeah. Does that include the military and security services? Well, why, why don't they tell us? Well, it's, it's simple. You ask a question to him. What you've just asked me, he answers it. Everybody knows. Well, there, there you go. Well, we've had this with Ben Wallace: silence, obfuscation, mm -hmm. and a gambit from Ben. Yeah, that's clearly got to sign off on this. Just regardless of whatever Love, the Permanent Secretary Stephen Lovegrove's agenda is there that he's putting in front of Ben, he has to sign off or not. He can say no. He's allowed to do that. Yeah. He can stand up and go, "No, I'm not doing that." But this silence on this issue. Where it's okie cokey, isn't it? Left leg in, left leg out. Yeah. Nobody knows. And, and that's where the uncertainty of everybody is. On top of the COVID, you know, we know what's going on and we've been trialled on this and trialled. This here is a black and white question. Yes, binary. It's either yes. Are we going to do it or, or no? There is no, nothing there that an MP or anybody else or Boris Johnson, anybody up to the Prime Minister level can say we're going or we're not going. Yeah. But to say nothing leaves people in limbo. Well, it can't. It smacks of the wrong kind of intrigue and attitude because at the, there's a historical precedence for this. Hess came over in World War II, didn't he, and made us an offer, and we said no. Then we didn't want to go in with Europe, in effect. So yeah. what's changed? <coughs> nothing. Well, I can't. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> nothing's so, changed. So well, what's new now? But the silence from Ben, because he's gambit at the moment, what we're seeing come out in the letters that's coming back from 
constituents that are concerned that are writing into their MP, yeah. is that there's a gambit now coming from the government that they think that they can essentially cherry pick in and out of defence union. So we're going to we'll do that exercise, do this, do that, but not do that. But I, I can't see, Rusty, how that's going to work because the European Defence Union is an all-in concept. How do they think that they're going to cherry pick ops? I've no idea because we're still in NATO, aren't we? And you, you can't have the pair. You know, well, we can't work for. I, I don't think we can go for the EDU and NATO. Uh, uh, so which one would you have? Well, uh, trialed and tested is NATO. It, don't fix something that ain't broken. It ain't broke. And if they want to go and do the EDU, let them do it. Perfect. We're, we're, we're an island. Yeah, yeah. Well, Anne <laughs> Whitcomb said this, didn't she? She was saying that the, one, the silence was unacceptable. Yeah. Two, she stated clearly, and as a minister and somebody very reliable, yeah. who's had portfolios in the government. You cannot serve two man's masters. And yeah, that that's we, right. we, we were, um, you know, that we would be a national military force in NATO. Yeah. That that was the way to do it, not to be into European Defence Union. She openly opposes. So that's the first British politician openly on a, on, a, on a platform politically to oppose it since Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was. And for awesome. 25 years, we've had silence. Yeah. And now you, you could wake up one day. And B, maybe out of the um, out in December, out of Brexit, but we could still find if you don't watch it that we might be in the EDU. Yeah, correct. Because nobody's saying we are or we're not. Correct. On the other hand, um, let's be honest. It could also be that maybe they don't want to say anything to ruffle the feathers until the day comes when we walk out, and then we stay as we are. And the EDU can't do anything about it. So it could be something along that type of lines as maybe <laughs> almost like a cover story. Um, let them carry on thinking, yeah, they're using our troops in their exercises, you know, the 100 paras there that were there EU for last week. EU4, Bosnia, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so they think, you know, maybe we've got them on a string. Um, we we'll just phone them up and tell them to come across, like I mentioned in mine, you know, dial a squatty. It doesn't, yeah, work. It doesn't yeah. work like that. No. And it takes a long time. But these guys are getting paid by our tax taxpayers. We're paying their wages, and all we're asking is a simple question. Yeah. And we don't what need... Is your, what is your defence policy? That's it. But there's a defence policy at the moment. When we come back to the policy and then Ben Wallace, Ben Wallace has gone invisible. He's like he's become, he's become the invisible minister. Yeah, yeah. He's probably, yeah. Um, I never thought about it that way, but you're quite right. Um, but he's still getting paid. Oh, yeah. You know, somebody has to do the donkey work and somebody has to take the slap on the backside and somebody has to take the praise. Yeah. All we're asking for is none of that. What's your policy? What's the policy? Yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, if we're talking of policy, Stephen Lovegrove, the Permanent Secretary, when he took on the role in 2016, made a speech at the Institute of Government very quickly where he highlighted the task and agenda and effectively what was government policy, <coughs> not party policy, yeah. government policy. And he's talking about taking 20 billion out of the capital budget of defence over 10 years. So what are we left with? And this is to draw, what they're effectively doing, Rusty, I think, is drawing down on the capital asset of our military, military itself yeah. to pay the pension. Yeah. Now that's not a defence policy. No, it is for them. In their head, it is. But that's but a financial policy. It's a financial policy. Not a defence policy. Yeah. Uh, I one, agree. Of, one of the things that he mentioned as well, which is now coming out in the press, is retraining. He wanted retraining and leadership, uh, and to have new innovation in the leadership there, which in the military. In the military. Which one, well, hang on a minute, what were the military doing before with training and leadership? The, tra the training and leadership is working in our forces. I can tell you, yeah. because I've been through You've it for it. 27 years. Yeah. Um, this sounds to me like, as you just said, what they're going to train, uh, all of a sudden they're going to pluck something out and say this is the way yeah. you're going to be trained and, yeah. and, and follow the but leadership. Who's, is, is that... Be going to be done internally with military training, military, or is that subcontractors coming in from outside, a third party coming into the military to do 
well, I mean, they might say they're doing training, who knows? What, you know, because there's, there's a substantial figure being mentioned here for the budget to come in and do equality and diversity training for the military now. There's a substantial sum of money that would, you know, depending what way you wanted to look at the policy, you know, well, we could put that money and keep the tanks or we could do that, you know, which is more important, fighting capability or equality and diversity? I mean, this is a, this is a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah, but like, again, the, the, the people who should be doing this are shying away to some, some degree and hoping that we're never going to mention it. But I think that obviously we need to be able to look after ourselves. We don't need a third party to come and train us in leadership and anything else. We've got the capability within. Yes. Wholeheartedly that's free. agree with that. Yeah, it's in there already. That's free. There's no cost. No. And that's free. Yeah. So this money here, whose back pocket, that's got, you know, exactly. where's that going to go? Yeah. We've got it. We don't need it from a third party. Yeah. Therefore, we don't pay them. Yeah. What we do is we keep it in ours. We put the money into our stuff and we become another force to be reckoned with again. But why isn't Ben Wallace saying what you've just said? Why isn't James Heafy saying what you've just said? Because they're terrified. They're terrified. Stand up, be counted, and the public will love you. Okay? At the moment, the public don't love you. That is it. Well, if they're not, you know, if they're not convincing and got that conviction there that you're talking about, they are not going to fall... Jing Jiaoping and Vladimir Putin for half a second. No. On anything. No. No. They need to take a, you know what, go and get a mirror, look at it, and say, that isn't the real me. Then stand up, start again, and don't appease anybody. Make sure you come out and let our public know, the people who want to know, the ex veterans, not just the ex veterans, um, the serving members, I'm not sure they would like to know what's going on. Great. Um, you know, and everybody else needs to know. Then it's out in the open, debate time. Have a debate Have about this debate. and the other. Um, break the, break and the fix deadlock, it. yeah. And fix it. Yeah. Third party, forget it. Why, why do you need a third party? Our leadership and everything else is there. It just needs to be allowed to come out. Absolutely. I can tell you. Absolutely. Rusty, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you've said there. Thank you very much indeed.